writers, you're listening to the 200th episode of the Kobo Writing Life podcast, where we bring you insights and inspirations for growing your self-publishing business. We're your hosts. I'm Joni. And I'm Stephanie. Welcome to the 200th episode. Before we get into the interview, we just want to quickly thank our listeners who continue to support our podcast and tune in weekly. We wouldn't be here without you. Thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate your support and we want to extend an extra big thank you to everyone who has been a guest on the podcast. We've talked to so many authors and industry professionals and it's been fantastic. Thanks for being my co-host, Joni. Steph, I believe this is an extra big milestone for you because you took over the podcast on episode 100. Yeah, I've been around now for 100 episodes. I feel like time has flown by, but I had so much fun interviewing everyone on the podcast. Everyone's been lovely. And I'm looking forward to the future episodes because we talk to really great guests. And I think our listeners are going to love it. On today's episode, we're bringing you a behind the scenes at Kobo conversation with Kobo CRM and marketing manager, Christina Mendez. Christina's actually been on the podcast before. She's joined me in a few interviews, so you might recognize her voice, but I'm very happy to have her on as a guest because she is so knowledgeable about selling eBooks internationally. And audiobooks. And audiobooks. Mm -hmm. And she also shares some insights about the Kobo customer that Joni and I had never heard of before. So lots of information. This is a great episode. We're going to stop talking and please enjoy the interview. Thank you, Christina, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. You have been on the podcast before. You have done some interviews for us. If anyone's listening, you might be like, your voice sounds familiar. But for anyone who doesn't know you, can you tell us who you are and what you do here at Kobo? So my name is Christina Mendez. I am a marketing manager in charge of CRM and online engagement. And what that means is that I'm basically responsible for the marketing presentation of all of the promotions that we send out, whether it's through emails, the banners on the website, uh, anytime we're promoting a sale like the KWL 40% off one we often do every month. I work with making sure that that gets out. How does it get presented? Who is it going to in our customer base? And also just working on little things on the website to try to improve content discovery and and usability for our customers. Very cool. So Kobo is an international retailer. What have you found are the main challenges marketing eBooks and audiobooks in different countries? Yeah, this is a super interesting question because before working at Kobo, I worked pretty much just at companies that were only based in Canada. So it's very much a different working environment when you're just focused on people in Canada and nowhere else. Um, So coming to Kobo and trying to figure out, okay, how do we do this on a global scale where we have customers that are in South Africa, in Italy, in France and all over. And some of the unique challenges with that, I think this is pretty hard for most people working at a global company is how do you step outside of yourself and outside of your culture and the country you live in to make sure that the messaging you're sending out is really unique and relevant to people that are living an entirely different lifestyle and entirely different culture than you. And it can be really hard, not just because it's difficult to understand what is someone's life in another country if you don't know people there, if you don't live there, But also you just get so used to thinking the way that you think that you don't always realize the tiny little things that you do or that you say that are not necessarily relevant or that don't resonate with other people. I think a great example of that is the way Kobo works is we usually treat most of our English language uh, countries as fairly similar. And then we do localization translations for some of our other countries that predominantly speak Spanish or French but you kind of need to get translations for the UK. But regardless, it's that kind of thing where you might have, you might not realize you're using something as slang. You might not realize that a very common phrase or a very common word could have a completely different definition in a country that speaks the exact same language as you, but just has its own unique vernacular. So that sort of like separating yourself from what you know the most can definitely be pretty challenging. But then there's also that element of understanding what is the value of being hyper-localized and making sure you're being super relevant to people in a single country to when does it become too cost ineffective to do that? And when can you get a a solution and, and solve a problem that people all over the world are having? what is the most generic messaging you can apply to those people? What is the sort of common denominator across all of those people to make sure that you're creating something that is going to have a positive return for you? 
So it's about making it universal, but not generic, I guess. Yeah. And it can be really challenging because there are times when you absolutely have to be hyper-localized. You have to understand the nuances in all the countries that you're talking to. Um, It just makes most sense. But there are times when you really need to pump up the volume on, no, this has to go out absolutely everywhere. Everywhere, And how do we make sure that it makes sense everywhere we're going without having to make 400 different versions of it? One of the things that we like to emphasize to our authors is that every single retailer is a little bit different. And if you're publishing on Kobo and Amazon and Apple Books and Google Play, Google Books, publishers should always be looking for opportunities within different retailers. What do you think that Kobo has to offer that's unique or what do people need to know about Kobo? One thing about Kobo and one of the reasons why I absolutely love working here is I think we're just that right size where we are big enough that we have data on our customers, that we can do a lot of stuff that's really interesting and data driven that challenges our assumptions of what people are reading and and what people might like. But we're not so big that we're entirely reliant on data and nothing else. We have that human element where we have merchandisers and we have marketers in all of our major countries who can really speak to you know, this is something, there's something about this book that we want to promote that an algorithm could not tell you. One thing that I think we do really well, it's my favorite thing that I get to work on, is the concept of personalized curation. And what that means for us is rather than being on one side of the spectrum and saying, hey, everything that we're going to do is so hyper-personalized and so data-driven that no human element is involved. And people, I think, The wrong side of that that people probably experience a lot is let's say you go on someone's website and you buy something that you wouldn't need to buy often, like a kitchen cart or a light bulb fixture or a toilet seat. And then all of your emails and all of your ads for like a month after are just more and more toilet seats. And you're like, I don't need more than one of these. I purchased it. It's fine. And that's when you're at a stage where a company is so big that it's just worth it for them to take that risk because their algorithm works enough that those situations are not losing them money. But we're also not on the total other side where you're so small, you have the opinions of only one individual person. So one person is creating a list and it's just of the things that they think should be in that list. It's just the new releases they think that you should hear about whether they're actually going to be important to you or not. And so the personalized curation that Kobo does is sort of meet somewhere in the middle where we say, you know what, we have 100 new releases going on this month. And of those 100, 50 of them have a lot of value and 50 of them are going to be really great. And we want to make sure those 50 are shown to our customers. And then we layer on the data to say, okay, if 50 of these new releases are great, these are the five that are unique and are perfect for you. And that element is really great. And I love that about working here because we get to try to take advantage of the best of both worlds. Can you tell us any insights into who the Kobo customer is based on the data that you have gathered over the years? Yeah, the Kobo customer, I usually try to describe as like kind of exactly who you picture as a reader, but like times 10, just like super exaggerated. So much like the sort of general reader demographics we see, the Kobo customer is usually a professional woman, but she's definitely a little bit on the older side, usually retired. I think one of the best reasons to talk about this is just if you're somebody in a lot of countries who have decided, hey, e-reading is what I want to do predominantly versus print, it's usually going to be for some kind of specific reason. So the fact that e-readers are so great with having a large volume of books on them without having to have a large volume of books in your house definitely lends itself to people who have a lot of time on their hands to read, which usually translates to people who are retired or maybe they're, they predominantly work from the home, as well as the fact that they're, again, those voracious readers who are just reading those genres that are, you just pick one up, you finish it in one sitting, and then you're on your next one already. So our reader reads a lot of romance and a lot of mystery for that reason, because they're just that perfect digestible genres. And as well, the fact that a Kobo e-reader is going to be super accessible for someone. So maybe you struggle with reading because you have to wear reading glasses. So the fact that you can go to an e-reader means you can increase the font size, or you have mobility accessibility issues that might make it hard to carry around a book the fact that you have a Kobo makes it a lot easier. So the Kobo reader is definitely somebody who needs to take advantage 
of why would you pick an e-reader over something else. So they have a lot of time to read. They love the ability of option and choice. So they read a lot and they read a lot in a single sitting. And again, they're just usually a little bit on the older side of the spectrum because they can make those customization choices. Do you have any information on how much a customer spends? Like maybe like on a book or like on a yearly basis? I don't know. There's some information we can share there, not obviously our exact numbers, of course. But one thing I can say is that when somebody is reading an e-reader, I think they spend, what we can say is they spend a lot more than you anticipate. So I think there's an expectation that for ebooks, the average price point that people are spending is maybe 99 cents to 99. But we can actually see that number for our main demographic, for our most voracious readers, we can see that number go upwards of $5 for an ebook and sometimes even more. I think there's this idea that for ebooks, because they're digital, because they seemingly have less upfront cost than a print book, people are only willing to spend a lot less on them and only want to spend a dollar or two dollars on them. But because of the appreciation for just how much variety and how much option they have, because the people who are reading ebooks are people who read so much they're willing to spend a little bit more for those quality books. They're used to spending $30 on a trade paperback, you know, $15 on a trade paperback. A seven, eight, nine dollar ebook is still a great deal and they can still get a lot more of them through that process. So they're definitely spending a little bit more than I think people anticipate. And over the course of their lifetime, that can start to add up to quite a bit and a quite higher price point than people might be used to. Though I will say that is definitely dependent on what country they're located in. So people in the U.S. spend a little bit less on digital books than people in Canada do. And I could be wrong about this, but I believe that there's no other country that spends as much on books as France. Because in France, there is this culture of very like literate, like books are not just important, but books are worth the money that you're going to spend on them. And as somebody who is, you know, a reader and who really wants to make sure that authors are supported in their work, no matter what medium they choose to publish on, I love that in France, you know, books are a little bit pricier because people are willing to pay more for what a book should cost. I've heard that about Australia and New Zealand as well from Kobo. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we see that a little bit too. The price point in Australia and New Zealand is definitely higher than the price point in some other countries. With our particular demographic, the US is probably the country that uh, spends the least amount on ebooks, where that $2.99 price point is probably a little bit closer to what they'd be more used to. But there's also a little bit more of a culture that just digital products should be aggressively cheaper in the States of how much they're marketed to. So that's one of the things that needs to be considered. So how does a reader know what a book is worth from one region to the next? So for authors who are publishing and are trying to figure out what is a good price point in that region, I think honestly, like research is your best friend. They're just looking up that country a little bit. If you're on the Kobo website, you can actually change your country. You guys have probably seen this before. You can change your country to show, okay, let's say I'm in Australia. You can see the Australia, New Zealand price points there. So you can take a look at what is the average cost of a new release in that country. And you can sort of see what's the average cost of a new release from a publisher, from another KWL author, and just taking a, doing a little bit of research and just learning a little bit more about that country in general. One thing I find super important is make connections with people who live in that country. Um, I think this is super relevant to everything we were talking about before, but if you know people that are local, that can provide you a little bit more insight into what is the value of a book and what is the value of a digital content in that country, that can also help you really understand, okay, how should I price this? To let you know, okay, I'm, I have a French translation. I'm trying to sell it in French. I can price this a little bit higher and probably see the same number of sales. Or if you're not somebody in the U.S., um, knowing people that can let you know, you know what, for the genre that you're selling, it might need to be a little bit lower. Do you have any other interesting insights or tips about selling in different regions or anything that you think people should know? The biggest one, it probably goes back to what I was just saying, is trying to find a network of people in the in those countries that can help you out. Even if it's just one or two other authors, booktubers, people just in the book community that can help you out. 
it's for us at Kobo, those people are our partners. There are retailers, there are KWL authors who are local in that country, since we do have some local Europe teams who connect with KWL authors in other countries as well. The value in having somebody who just intrinsically understands the market you're talking to, because like I said, one of the hardest things is just trying to remove yourself from your situation and put yourself into, okay, what is the culture in that life like to make sure that you're, you're talking appropriately and that you're, you're feeling really localized? That can be so difficult. But if you make a great community of people where they can reach out to you for information about the market you're in and vice versa, it's going to be so much easier than flying blind and just trying to understand a market where your books are selling and you don't know why and you don't know what to do, how to push them forward. Just, you know, people are generally pretty nice. You can probably find somebody in that country that can help you out if you're willing to help them out as well. Do you find that there's a difference when you're marketing ebooks and audiobooks? Is there a difference or? I love this question because there's actually a massive difference. And I could talk about this so long because I find it, it so interesting. So when you're marketing ebooks, it's very similar to marketing a traditional print book. The reason somebody ultimately is going to choose to buy your book is going to be because of the content in that book. Um, If you've done a great job at marketing what that content is, people are going to be excited about it. But what everyone wants to know at the end of the day, even if they've gotten a recommendation from somebody else, which is one of the most powerful selling tools, they want to know why. Like, what is in this romance book that's going to make me love it? And someone says fake dating and you're like, great, I'm in. You know, that matters more than a lot of other things. It matters sometimes even more than the cover, the author, just the content of that book is so important. And then all the other things come into play. The author comes into play, the cover, the marketing, all that stuff matters, but the content is king for an ebook or a print book. And when Kobo launched with audiobooks in 2017, we definitely approached it the same way. Why would an ebook and an audiobook be drastically different? But we noticed that something was missing. So we did a lot of market research and a lot of surveys with our customers and with audiobooks customers to understand what are you looking for in an audiobook that you're not currently getting right now? And what we found out is that while an ebook the content drives the purchase intent. When it comes to an audiobook, people are looking at them way more because of the situation they're currently in and what is the situation they want to listen to an audiobook in. The content and what the audiobook is actually about is almost secondary or even tertiary to, uh, you know, I want to read a book that I can listen to while I'm jogging which means it needs to be fast paced. It needs to be easy to understand. Um, I need to be able to get through it in short, like 30 minute intervals. And it almost doesn't matter if it's a thriller or if it's nonfiction. It just has to be easy to listen to that way. The most popular use case for audiobooks is actually people that want to listen to audiobooks in bed to help them go to sleep. So the actual audiobook matters a lot less when what they're really looking for is narrators that have really calm, soothing voices. They're looking for subject matter that isn't going to keep them awake at night. They want something that is going to lull them into a very comfortable, restful sleep and that, you know, they can easily pick back up the next day. So it's really interesting because when you consider it from that point, rarely are you than marketing a single audiobook, unless it's something like Becoming by Michelle Obama, where the purpose of that audiobook is that, of course, I want to listen to Michelle Obama talk to me for 20 hours. Unless you're looking at that level, you're usually marketing a collection of audiobooks. So you can actually go to the website now um, for Kobo.com and you can see we have audiobooks lists as something that you can navigate to on our website. And that's where we have grouped together a bunch of audiobooks under those headings of audiobooks to make you laugh, audiobooks for when you have kids in the car, audiobooks for when you're trying to do chores. And that is so much more valuable to people who listen to audiobooks than audiobooks that are romance with the fake dating plot line, even though, you know, I might disagree that like, that's why I'm, I'm reading. That's not necessarily why I'm listening. And I think a really important thing to know, so if you're a KWL author that has 
ebooks and audiobooks. I think this is a really important thing to understand because it means that the way you talk about your audiobook should be different than the way you talk about your ebook. The keywords that you put into the description of your audiobook should be a little bit different because it's going to help you out a lot more if instead of saying, hey, I have this new release, and, and let's say you're even talking to an existing fan base you might have, maybe you have your own newsletter, and you're reaching out to them and you're saying, hey, I have a new release, here's the ebook, here's the audiobook, you'd probably be much better served by saying, hey, here's the ebook, here's what the book is about. And then when promoting the audiobook, say, hey, you know, are you stuck at home right now, busy with your kids 24-7? Do you want to drown them out for even one hour a day? We have an audiobook option available for this book. And that's going to serve you a little better. It's going to make your readers a lot happier because it gives them context for why they, why they would pick the audiobook as well, which I think is super helpful when audiobooks are so much more expensive than ebooks too. Getting somebody into your audiobook is probably going to be a lot helpful than getting a chance to get them into your ebook. And it's, yeah, it's just about understanding that. I think it's about understanding the core that when I look for an ebook, I'm looking for content to help me escape. And when I look for an audiobook, I'm looking for something that fits into my life so that I can read more. And that's why, you know, understanding what is the best use case is, is how we refer to it for your audiobook is so important. It's not that the content doesn't matter at all. If it's a bad audiobook, it's a bad audiobook. That's not going to be great but pushing what situations your audiobook is best for and definitely highlighting any narrators or casting choices that you've made are going to be so much more important. That is fascinating. And I actually didn't know a lot of the places where people were listening to audio. Do you find, I don't know if you'll know this, but do you know if Kobo readers tend to buy both the ebook and the audio for one title? From what we've seen so far, I don't think so. I think there's this idea that in an amazing world, we'd all want to have the ebook and the audiobook. And if I'm in a situation where I can sit down and read and I have the luxury of time, I will. But then I can listen to that audiobook when I don't have time anymore and I'm on the road and I can just pop in the audio. But I actually find that the way it looks for our readers is that what they read is very different than what they listen to. So like what we were saying earlier, people read books because it fits what they like to read. So if they're picking up ebooks that are like their favorite genres, that are their favorite authors. They're the kind of stuff that they want to luxuriate in that escape and luxuriate in that time that they have. Whereas they're picking audiobooks that they might not typically sit down and read, like nonfiction, biographies, maybe um, com like I find celebrity lifestyle books are always the best one as audios. The biography memoirs are amazing. You would probably rarely sit down and read them, but listening to Ali Wong just talk about, you know, her life becoming a comedian is definitely a lot funnier. So people are, are purchasing very different audiobooks based on what they're looking to do with those audiobooks. Do you guys read the same books that you listen to or do you find even for yourself it's the same? No, it's way different. And it's like you said, like I didn't realize the audiobooks I'm picking are based on the activity I'm doing because I only listen to audiobooks while I'm like going for a walk. And those are always nonfiction because I'm like, let me learn something and do double time. But like when you said people listen to audiobooks for going to bed, my first instinct was like, are they paying attention to it? Or they literally just like calm, calmly. No, I used to do it. that. I was a bed listener. Yeah. Yeah. I just it's, because if you're if you're stressed, like I would use it if I was worrying and it was keeping me awake. This is like a long time ago, but yeah, I didn't. I don't really care whether they have a soothing voice, but just I want to listen to something that's taking me away from what I'm thinking about. That's fair. It's the number one reason that people selected. Like they want an audiobook that they can listen to in bed. Like that is what they would prefer. And as somebody who has gotten used to like listening to a lot of audiobooks, it was something I did before. I totally get it. I think there's something unique in an atmosphere that an audiobook can create at night when you're lying in bed and all the lights are off and maybe you're listening to like a good mystery or, you know, that kind of nonfiction book that just it just hits right. Like you're, you're paying attention, <laughs> but you're not like you're, you're ingesting what's going on, but yeah. you're not so focused on it. You're like, oh my God, what's going to happen next? That you're not going to also fall asleep once you're done. Maybe that's what I should be doing instead of listening to music. The I don't know. This thing is, is opening ideas out. for me. 
you don't get any kind of jarring noises like you would if you had, I know some people will put on a television show or something oh. and sometimes there can be something that jars yeah. you awake, whereas an audiobook is pretty consistent for the most part. Yeah. I like listening to audiobooks in bed as well, um, but I wouldn't do a podcast because I would be totally, like the moment I heard an ad, I would immediately be like annoyed. (laughs) ASMR videos on YouTube have the ads, (laughs) as we all know. But okay, so back to what we were talking about. You've already given, I would say, a lot of marketing tips so far. But if there's one tip for every indie author or small publisher that they should do, what would you say it should be? I mean, I hate to be repetitive, but that's my answer what... for this is definitely back to the idea of like, create your community, find people in other countries who can really help, who can really help you understand those. But if we're taking it away from the global aspect for a moment and just like, what's a good marketing tip in general, I would say really understand your audience get an idea of who is going to read that book i think particularly when you're an indie or you're a small pub and maybe you don't have the resources of a larger publisher to cast a really wide net like i think we all want to believe that our books are great and that they should go out to absolutely everybody but at the end of the day every book has its market and when you don't have that large pocket of money Sometimes trying to cast that net too wide, you're actually spending way more than you would and getting a lower return than if you found that, what is that niche market that's really going to resonate or is going to be more inclined to pick up your book for the first time and hopefully talk about it with other people. So I think a good example of this is let's say you have like an action thriller or an action mystery book that you're trying to push. I think it's easy to say, oh, that's a popular genre. I can market this to everybody and and the most number of people are going to like it. But again, there's so many mystery books out there. There's so many books to read. Any small amount of marketing money that you have is going to be battling against all of this noise. Whereas if you took it back a little bit and you said, okay, one of the purposes of this book is to, you know, maybe people are trying to find out who did it at the end. Like if you understand that that's the book you've created and that your audience is going to be people who like to solve a mystery and really want to, you might actually be better off targeting people like let's use Facebook targeting ads as an example. I think that's something a lot of small pubs might reach out to. You can target people who have liked the Facebook pages of those take home murder mystery kits where every month they get like a delivery and they slowly have to figure out like who is sending them these packages or people who have liked Facebook pages of local escape rooms. Like you can reach out to an audience of people who is inherently inclined to be interested in an action mystery, as opposed to just say, I want to reach out to everybody who likes reading mystery books. And that is probably going to be way more of value to you than anything else. Same thing where like, if you're a romance author and you've got a romance book, try to really narrow down who is that romance for? Who is who is that your like protagonist and your couple going to speak to the most? And what are the other things that they're going to like? And trying to reach out to them that way. I'm going to ask a difficult question and be a bit of an asshole. <laughs> but, oh. So let's say the author has found their niche. What tip would you tell them they should be doing? They've done everything you've done, you've said to do, what should they be looking at next? Looking at next, I think would be in this day and age with everything being social media and everything being people like an element of trust. I mean, we can see how big influencers are in marketing, whether you like it or not, they're popular for a reason. I think people like the idea that somebody is guaranteeing this book for them. They're saying, Hey, this is a good idea. So if you've identified that audience and let's say you've even done that Facebook targeting, the next thing I would look at is who is a voice that would speak to the kind of people you're talking to. Even going so far as, you know, using the action thriller example, which is a very popular genre, obviously, you know, are there really small true crime podcasts you can reach out to that might not have very expensive advertising fees, where they have a very small but loyal base that is gonna be more likely to listen and trust their recommendation than spending more money to go out to a really, really big podcast and get advertising dollars with them. But they're also advertising Blue Apron and Nick's Bras and a bunch of other things where it's like, no, you can find small people that have small communities, but because of those small communities, those people trust them more. 
And I think when you're dealing with a really small amount of money or sometimes no money at all, reaching out to those small people and saying, hey, would you like a free copy of this book in order to review it? I know that that's a super popular element. I think we can do that, but reach beyond just booktubers and reach out to people who do podcasts relevant to your audience, people who do you know, like people who do makeup tutorials could be really relevant if you're doing a certain kind of romance book. Like there is a good chance that there could be some overlap in that audience. So I think that kind of thing is really important. Find other small people with really small reaches and and try to reach out to them and working with them can build a really interesting community. That's great advice. I think, yeah, no, it is good advice because a lot of the time I think it's possible that authors are reaching out to like preaching to the choir, right? They're reaching out to people that have read their books before and you've got those people, like they're with you. So I think what you're suggesting is a really great idea because you're reaching the people that aren't fans yet, but they might become fans. Yeah. And like the thing about on YouTube, you're gonna, let's say you've asked someone to review their book and they do, that video may show up to like a bunch of other people you never thought based on the algorithm. So it's like, that's a different way, I think of thinking of book marketing. Yeah. I think it's really easy to think of, okay, I need to go out to people who I know are going to read. And to be fair, those booktubers, all those traditional ways are good. Like there's absolutely value there because you're reaching out to people who read a ton a year. But there's also value in those people that don't actually read very often, but that aren't really being marketed to because people don't go out to them with books because they don't read very often. But if you reached out to them through these really niche markets, you can be you know, that one or two book that they read every year. Um, I would like to ask, and it's okay if you don't have an answer, I'm just interested. When it comes to marketing in different countries and working with cultural differences and language differences and all those things, are there any, like you gave us an example earlier, but do you have any good examples of something that works really well in one place, but doesn't in another or something that you wouldn't maybe know about that works really well somewhere? Yeah. This one is a bit weird and I I hope I get the country right because I deal with like 15 unique countries in addition to like the global stuff that we do. So hopefully I get the country that I'm talking about right. But in general, in email marketing period, no matter what industry you're in, sending an email on like a Thursday or Friday or before a weekend is when you're going to get the best results. Particularly for books, we find that emails sent on Fridays and Saturdays, when people are looking for something to read that weekend, do the absolute best. So we've always, for the most part, we operate under the idea of we send our highest value emails, our highest value sales. We send those out on Fridays and Saturdays in particular is when we send out our recommendations email. So we're very happy with that. Um, And we were sending it out to, I hope I'm correct, Mexico at that same rate. And our Mexico base is, you know, it's of a certain size of the number of people that email. It's not the largest base. Um, And we didn't have somebody who was looking too heavily into it at the time, but we got a, a merchandiser who joined us to help work with Spain and Mexico and just Spanish language in general. And she flagged to us that she actually thinks we should send out our emails in Mexico on Mondays. And we were like, well, that's weird because Mondays is the worst day to send out an email. We would rarely do that for our biggest sales. But in this particular, like where are our customers in that country are largely located, a lot of people don't have regular internet access. And so if you send them an email on Saturday, they're not going to see it on Monday because they see all of their emails when they're at work with their internet access at work. So it completely changed the context for the order of which we had to do promotions and the order of which we had to reach out to people in Mexico because suddenly we're removing ourselves from our experience of we have internet pretty much all of the time uh, or if we don't, we have ways to access it through libraries and things like that. Whereas you might be in a country where everybody's internet access comes from their work and that's not something they deal with at home. So that's a really great example I think of You know, if you're reaching out to countries where there's just not necessarily, maybe the country is more rural than not. So there's not necessarily the infrastructure where a lot of people in that country are going to have access to Wi-Fi. Pause. If you're doing Facebook ads with, you know, the little bit amount of marketing spend you might have, pause your ads on the weekends. Send them out on weekdays between, you know, nine to five in that country's time zone. And I think this is another one where France always comes up just because the way that they view books is so vastly different, which I always love. You know, we, we really highlight books at a certain price point in email marketing. Email marketing is driven with here's recommendations and here's sales. 
And that's pretty much what we bounce around between. There's lots of other emails, but that's the primary driver between email sales. Whereas in France, you know, those are super valuable. Sales are important everywhere, but new releases at 17 euros can do amazingly there. So talking a little bit more about the history of a book, the fact that in Europe, um, particularly in France, but in a lot of countries of Europe, they actually really like photos of authors. Like that's not something that we have here. I think that if you're in North America, most people don't know what an author looks like and they're fine with that. They don't need to know. But in Europe, the very popular authors, like their pictures will be everywhere. Ads for their books will have their photos on them. So if you wanted to layer, lend that air of credibility to something that you're doing in France or the UK or Italy, you might add, you know, a professional photo of yourself and it makes your book look that much more professional and that much more worth the time of somebody who's trying to figure out what to read against all this other stuff. Christina, that was like, I just asked you a fun, silly question. You gave us like no. five fantastic tips. So thank you. That was really good. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Four and a half years of marketing here. (laughs) True. I'm just wondering, so we've covered kind of email tips, but has anything surprised you about like a book that's done really well, either in like an email campaign you guys have done or like just in general, this book sold so well and you don't even know why? Oh, I mean, that's a good question. This is hard. Sorry. I'm, I'm sure that I have an answer. I just need a second to remember what it is. We got time. Don't worry about it. I send out just as like, just for awareness, everybody, of what we're doing, we send out over 200 unique email campaigns every single month. So you're asking a lot for me to go through my brain of everything that we've sent out. What did really, really well that was unexpected? And we do have Julia de Lestrange in France, who had enormous success with her first mm-hmm. indie novel. Oh, I can actually share one as well. Okay. Um, that's, that's a great example. One that we did not anticipate, um, the Kobo original, actually, The Marrow Thieves. So obviously, that book is amazing. It's excellent. If you haven't had a chance to listen to it, I highly recommend. The audiobook is so good, but the actual ebook itself is good. But like we were talking about the standard Kobo customer, overwhelmingly, they read genre fiction. Literary fiction in some countries is more popular than others. Like in Canada, literary fiction is pretty strong. But we would normally expect our top books to be a lot of, A, like really popular bestsellers of that moment, and then B, the top romance, the top mystery, that, that kind of stuff people are just binging through. So while we knew the Marathies was important and it would be good and we would promote it, I don't think we anticipated how much people would love that audiobook. Now, even now, it's one of our most popular audiobooks. And I'm so happy about that. Like the quality of it is excellent. But it was one of those things where for whatever reason, it just really picked up. People were really excited to try audiobooks for the first time with the Marrow Thieves. I'm not 100% positive what use I know, case they were looking for in that case. In an audiobook, I would say. It's a lot. Yeah, I, it's one of those things where sometimes stuff happens where you're like, I have no answer for this. I don't know what's going on. I'm happy it's happening. <laughs> I've never been happier in my life. I think we probably have more examples of books that we thought were going to do better and then did not quite do as well. But that was a really exciting one. Do you know what year that came out? Because I literally read like a really good review about the Marrow Thieves audiobook like last week. And I think it's been out for a couple years now. Yeah, I want to say the audiobook version we did was 2008. What? Nope. No, 2018. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> I meant 2018. I was really focused on the eight part of that the equation. <laughs> 2018. Uh, yeah, that makes I want to say yes. 2018. So it's been a while. And even now, even like to this day in, in our English speaking countries, it's one of the top audiobooks. Don't forget Bathyclus. That's that's the thing. You can have a really great book that was published like 10 years ago. Yes. Well, and that I, is I a true that. thing. Like, I think that we get a little bit caught up in the industry of thinking because there's so many new books coming out and we get sent arcs and all that kind of thing. Like we read everything that comes out now. But That is not how I was reading before I started working at Kobo. Like now I'm all like, give me the new fresh stuff. But I was never like that. Like it takes a few years. You see a book, you have someone takes it on vacation. They tell you how great it was. Like backlist stuff sells forever. And that's so true for eBooks in particularly. I would say our backlist is so much more important than our new releases. It's why when you ask me that question, I'm like, I have way more examples of books that didn't do as well. 
because typically people that are going to buy a book the moment it comes out, they don't always pick digital. A lot of times if the book is available in print, they'll pick that. So, you know, you would anticipate like an E.L. James release would be amazing, especially as an e-reader or as an e-book copy. But the people that were going to buy that the day it came out, they bought it in print. They wanted a physical copy. Whereas the people that are eventually going to buy it in digital, they're going to wait some time. They're going to pick it up when they're ready to read it. Um, so it's super important for us. Our, our best stuff is always our sales where it's like, you know, start a new series of a series that's been out for years and, and start it with the first one being at like a really discounted price. And then you'll buy the rest at full price. Um, I'm sure KWL authors will be very familiar with that premise. It's great for us. And our recommendations engine, because recommendations doesn't consider release date whatsoever. It's just, hey, here's a title we think you're really going to like. It was released 20 years ago, but enough people have bought it that bought the things that are also in your library that were like, hey, we think you're going to like it. And it works out really well that way. Can you talk about how our recommendations work? Like a little more insight into how we take a user's library and their reading preferences and push it out to them in an email? Yeah, so our recommendations engine is really interesting in that it looks at a couple of different elements of a way someone interacts with a book. We can't talk about like every single thing it looks at and how much it, it weights everything that it looks at, but it, it certainly takes a look at, you know, I, I've purchased this many books. Like if you look at my Kobo library, I have like 400 books in there. And some of them I have finished, I have liked, um, I've left a review for, maybe I didn't like it and it got, gave it like a two stars. And I've interacted with all 400 of those books. And what a recommendation algorithm really does is it looks at you know, the data points that I've sort of inputted, I've sort of given Kobo by doing all of those actions and taking all of those things. And it finds other people who have relatively similar libraries to me. They might have, you know, 200 books and maybe 50 of the 200 books they have overlap with 50 of the 400 books that I have. And they'll say, okay, well, because we have so many of the same books, and because I, I purchased and I liked all of these books, that person now has a certain affinity to some of the books that are in my library. And then if there's a third person that has 20 books from my library and 30 books from the second person's library, now we're all getting recommendations from each other because there's something in common with all of us. And we kind of go with the idea of, okay, because you like this book, and other people who liked that book liked these books, here's those books that you're gonna like. And then it just branches out further and further and further. So it's really, it's very much based on just how are people interacting with your books. If you want a book that is gonna show up in a lot of people recommendations, yes, having a lot of people buy it helps, but having a book that people finish, like actually all get all the way to the end helps. Having a book that people rate and leave a review on helps so much. Even if they don't rate it very well, um, it sends a little bit of a signal of saying, you know what, they didn't like this book. So that means that we're not going to send this book to other people who probably wouldn't like it. We're going to use that energy and we're going to send it to people who we think are going to like it. So even that can help quite a bit. A couple of negative ratings can help make sure your book is going out to the right people. And also really strong metadata helps a bit. I'm sure that that has been talked about a ton. I know that Steph has talked about it. Yep. Mm -hmm. One of the signals that we'll look at is that metadata. Uh, And this comes into play with the idea of language in particular. Like if you have a book that maybe you've translated into multiple languages, we are going to recommend books to customers in the language that they prefer. So your metadata being on point with the language is going to help. If you are publishing the eighth book in a series and a customer has your first three books, making sure the series metadata is in there means that we are going to be way more likely to recommend your new book, even if it doesn't have any, per, any data in it yet. Like there's no signals to let someone know they're going to like that book. You just released it. No one's done anything with it yet. But if your metadata is on point, if it's linked correctly, it's going to register, hey, this is part of a series, and that series has these data points. So your metadata is super important, and having a readership that gets all the way to that end of that book and that is encouraged to engage with that book beyond just finishing it is going to matter a lot. I have a question about that. Sometimes on Kobo, 
there'll be a lot of back matter in a book and I won't necessarily go through all the back matter and then my Kobo won't know that I've finished the book. Is that true? Kobo has a system in place to count. If your back matter is excessive, if there is a lot, Mm -hmm. uh, it might not necessarily register. But I would make sure that, you know, you can definitely have it. A customer doesn't necessarily need to get to the last page of your book to mark it as finished. But it shouldn't be like 50% is book and 50% is a preview chapter for the next book. As long as it's predominantly your story and someone getting to the end means they're getting at least, you know, a certain percentage of the way through it, you should be good. Um, but then there's also the option that Kobo provides of once someone has gotten, excuse me, to that level, we'll say, do you want to mark the book as finished? Mm -hmm. And so obviously it's going to be a little bit better if the customer chooses to do that. But even if they haven't, there are some internal signals that Kobo has to say, we would classify this book as finished based on how long a customer got through it. Okay. That's good to know. So they can put in back matter. Yes. Just not like a reasonable amount, I think. (laughs) Can you also talk to us a little bit about pre-orders? And whether or not you think that's important for indie authors to put their books on pre-order for a period of time? Putting a pre-order out there is never going to hurt. There's no negative reasons to keep your book um, from going up on the website until the very day that it launches. There are some benefits. If you are someone that has a readership built in um, and they're going to be a little bit more inclined to pre-order your next book, you can start off on your very first new release date with some data points. And that's going to be super helpful for uh, recommendations engines, for new release engines, anything we do that is based on an algorithm. Having even a handful of purchases is going to be helpful. So a pre-order can definitely help you there. But for the most part, with ebooks, we just see in general that people don't pre-order as much as they would a regular book. Very reasonably, there's no concern your book is going to sell out. So I think it's fine that customers might not necessarily be pre-ordering. So while I, I'd say it's, it's not necessary by any means, I'm not saying like if you don't have it, there's a problem. But again, having it certainly doesn't hurt. Putting it up there for a little while can just get a couple of those points of getting page views can help you out in the long run so that you can get more page views by the time your book is actually launched. I wish there was a better like, yes do it. You're going to make so much more money, but it's just one of those things where it's certainly good to do, would recommend, but you know, I don't think your book is going to fail if you don't. I mean, it makes sense. It's not, you don't have to go to the store. It's always going to be there waiting Mm -hmm. for you. Exactly. I think that's the big thing. Like pre-orders are definitely a layover of the idea Mm -hmm. of like, I I want to make sure I have this book. Like I want to be the first one who gets it. And now it's like, you can just wake up that morning. And you can buy it and you're going to have it. At 12 a.m. if you want it, yeah. <laughs> at 12 a.m. if you want it. That is the nice thing if you were trying to like, if you really do want pre-orders, because I do get that there's some value there, I would say letting uh, your customers know that if they get a pre-order off of Kobo, uh, their book will automatically download like at midnight that day, as long as their Kobo's turned on. So they could get that book literally immediately and they wouldn't have to do any work. So that that's a nice selling point, but again, not super necessary. And this is my service announcement. Make sure you have the final file ready three <laughs> days before your release date. Please and thank you. <laughs> Our next question would be, where do you see marketing and publishing in five to 10 years? It, like if you have an answer, I'm not sure. Girl, this is a wild question. I know. Uh, <laughs> this is partly a wild question just because I think my answer three months ago is vastly different than what my answer is today. That's a good point. Yeah. We are uh, recording this in, what month is this? May. Publishing has been so slow to adopt a lot of things that I think that we know are super important. Obviously, as a digital retailer who sells exclusively ebooks and e-readers, we know that digital publishing is super, super important, even if the growth of it was nowhere near, I think, what people expected. I think a lot of people, when ebooks came up, was like, oh, this is a thing. Everybody's going to want to read an ebook. All the young people will want digital copies of books. And then it was literally the complete opposite, where older people prefer to read e-readers and younger people are buying a lot of print. And so because of that, publishing just like slowed down to adopt digital completely. And now, you know, the fact of the matter is we're in the middle of a global pandemic. To purchase a book at this particular moment in print is almost a little unresponsible. There's so many issues with delivery that, you know, is somebody who is out there and is, is putting their life at risk, should they be packaging up a book or should they be packing up groceries? You know, there is an alternative 
that keeps you safe as much as safe as possible, that keeps you from meeting delivery drivers, that keeps people focused on essential deliveries. And that's, it, it's eBooks. It gives you all of the benefits of the things you want from print available in your home as long as you have internet. Like, don't get me wrong. I say this, I love print. I totally get that there's value in it, but we're definitely in a position that pushes the idea that right now digital is just safer and because of that, because I think a lot of publishers right now are looking at the fact that all of their plans for the next year just have to change dramatically. New release dates are being pushed back. Reliance on the launch of a print book is no longer the number one. They're really focusing on digital media, on digital publishing, on ebook and audiobook copies. I think we're going to see the industry speed up quite a bit on the value of ebooks and with that the value of low cost almost like self-publishing like industry tactics so one publisher that i always think of as being ahead of the curve is actually harlequin just by nature of they're like the only publisher that has a customer facing brand that the average person is aware of and because they have that they react a little bit differently than I think a traditional publisher does in most cases. And they definitely don't necessarily have those airs of like, your book needs to be in print. It needs to have 20,000 copies. You need to be on the New York Times bestseller list for it to be successful. I don't think that Harlequin necessarily has that. And because of that, for the last couple of years, they've had their imprint, Karina Press. And I think Karina Press is probably as close to a self-publishing arm that a traditional publisher would ever get. It's digital first, sometimes digital exclusive. Um, and it's a great testing ground for a publisher to release a book with a very low upfront cost to them, see what the audience engagement is, and then plan a more traditional release after that. And I think that the way things are changing right now and the way publishing was probably always headed, but now is just going to have to step into high gear is release your books digital first. Let people experience them at a lower cost, right in the palm of their hand with an e-reader on their phone. And then books turn into something that is a little bit more important, a little bit more like you're buying a book because you like the feel of the book, because you love the book itself. You want to hold it in your hand. You want to physically share it with people. And I think that that creates a more, you know, now that we see what the ebook sales are, we can justify turning this into a print book. And I think that we'll probably see a lot of that happening in publishing. I, I hope. I think that that's probably a smarter way to look at a lot of things um, because inherently that style also encourages more diverse authors and more diverse voices and stories from different backgrounds. Right now, the way traditional publishing works, and I'm sure KWL authors are very familiar with this, having chosen to go with self-publishing, is that if an author feels, if a publisher feels like there's too much risk to publish a book with a 5,000 copy run, with how many stores they're gonna to need to hold that book, if they feel that the risk is there, they're not gonna publish you at all. And the fact of the matter is, it's unfortunate and it's not fair, that version of like risk is often put on diverse authors who are writing unique and interesting stories that don't have the background of like, I'm writing a cowboy romance, we know this is popular. I'm writing a sci-fi fantasy about three right dudes taking a walk. We know that's going to be popular. Like when you eliminate those trends, you take a risk. And I think if we're where publishing is moving towards and where it should be moving towards in the next five, 10 years is if there is a lower upfront cost to publishing a book, inherently more diverse stories can be told because you, you lose that aspect or that excuse of risk on a traditional publisher. It's like, we might as well publish them. Like it's very easy to publish things digital first. Um, just making a great ebook copy and getting buy-in from retailers who sell ebooks can do everything that it can to, to make that happen. That's a great answer. And I don't think we've heard it before. I think, awesome, thank you. Maybe it's uh, too much optimism. Maybe five, 10 years from now, publishing will look exactly the same as it does now. But that is my- so. I don't think so. I think that's, I, I hope that that's a realistic prediction. I think that's the way we're heading. I like to see it, I, especially with the push right now for more diverse stories in general. I mean, mm. I'm certainly someone that's like that. I love books. I read so many of them. So when I get to the point where I feel like I'm reading the same book for a second time, I'm like, no, I don't, I don't want this. Give me a different book. <laughs> so I, I love reading books that come from unexpected sources or people that aren't traditionally published. 
Um, so I'm, I'm seeing that it feels like that's the area we're moving into. And I do hope that more traditional publishers look to like Karina Press. I get Karina Press has a very specific kind of book that it's kind of, it's trying to publish. But I think if you look to them as a model, a lot more traditional publishers can start to publish way more interesting things. I wonder if print on demand will now be like, if you want a book from a publisher, you have to request it. Like, I mean, maybe I, not, but like, I could see that going that like for a niche, like you said, a digital only, if you want that in a print, you have to let us yeah. know. I think where it probably ends up mirroring is people talk about the music industry and the TV mm-hmm. industry in relations to books a lot. Um, and I think it's why people have that little bit of a, a fear of books getting too digital. And I totally understand that because I, don't get me wrong, I love streaming through Netflix and Crave so much. I have my Spotify account, but I understand that I am paying so much less for those things than I would have otherwise. And maybe even undervaluing the people mm-hmm. that are actually making that content. Like I understand that's what happened. So I, is happening. So I understand why people would be scared for books to go into that area. But I actually suspect that what might end up happening with books might be something that we're going to start seeing or have seen already with magazines, where the digital content is much more widely available and is much more the default option. And you get the physical version because it's beautiful, because, Mm -hmm. you know, the quality of books is going to get better. I think we start seeing way more hardcovers and way less trade paperbacks because, The book you're buying is like, this is a symbol of how much I love this book. So I want it to look beautiful. I want it to have the gold lining. I want it to have a really elaborate jacket. I think that's something that we could possibly see how much, we'll we'll see how much it goes. But definitely it aligns with the way that I like to read as well. Like I I do digital first with everything. And if I love it and if I want to support the author, I then also buy their physical books. Same. And that is what my, yeah, that's what my bookshelf is made up of. Books that I love so much Mm -hmm. that I've read them multiple times. But books are decorative as well in a way that DVDs and VHS and stuff are not. Yeah. Just the ability to like pick really beautiful oh like I'm already picturing the bookshelves color coordinated <laughs> just like gorgeous books on it that is probably even more than five ten years out I think it's going to be a long time before we see that but definitely I think when it's probably going to be gen z over millennials to be honest you're definitely starting to see it though yeah I think if you're someone that like literally from the moment you were born the concept of owning something just doesn't really exist as much like you yeah. own you own collections mm-hmm. you own things for some prestige but you don't just own things to get rid of them and i think when we see that coming up a little bit more that's when this starts to happen and maybe books become a little bit more like collecting vinyl mm, mm. yeah that's a good comparison can you tell us what you've been loving lately i can i'm so excited for this <laughs> i'm prepared <laughs> Steph will have her own thoughts because we've talked about this before is this a book? but i recently read it is a book of course mm-hmm. it's a book. okay I recently read, uh, my favorite author is N.K. Jemisin, and I recently read her latest book, The City We Became, and I loved it. I am, it's, it's so different from her other books. Um, I definitely love it for different reasons than I love her other stories, but it's an urban fantasy set in New York, and it's the concept of what if a city could become alive? Like, what if a city was a living, breathing thing once it got old enough and once there was enough of a, like, mythos around it? And the way she writes is beautiful. It's a very interesting book to read in the middle of what's going on in New York right now, where there are like empty streets. Like it, it provides a a interesting dichotomy, which I think is, is worth reading. So I'm loving that. But then on a lighter note, I'm also uh, listening to Samantha Irby's Wow, No Thank You. All of her books are collections of personal essays from her blog, and they're all very funny They're very raw. They're very like, there's something about them that is so absolutely laugh out loud, hilarious, no matter what they're about. Um, She has a a newsletter, a daily newsletter, where she literally just recaps what happened on Judge Mathis the day before. And I, I like, I read them every day. Like I'm in love with them. There's something about the way that she writes that I find so hilarious. She could be talking about absolutely nothing, which sometimes she is. And I'm like invested heavily. So very in love with those things. Does she narrate her own audiobooks? She does. I'm glad to hear that. She was on a podcast that I listened to yesterday. So I'm like, I feel like it's just in my brain. Um, But yeah, she's having a moment. Everyone loves that book. I am so happy to see that because I had been following her blog 
um, I think it was after her first book came out officially. If I remember correctly, she like self-published, I think. Do you know the story of her blog? She was talking about it in this interview. Do you know what the Um, deal is? Like, no, she started it like because she was dating a guy and he was like, oh, I like writers. And she was like, I could like, I'm not writing a book, but she basically, she started this on a kind of dating dare. And then, wow. Yeah, it's, it's really funny. I need to, like, I'm probably misremembering this. I only listened to it once, but it was something ridiculous like that. And then all her friends were like, no, we like this. Please keep writing. Like, we check this blog. I don't think I knew that specifically, although that sounds like the kind of thing that's probably in one of her books that I have just missed completely. But it also sounds very on brand. The way that she talks about, like, certain parts of her life just fit in with that wonderfully. I love it. Yeah, she was very funny. So, and yeah, what was I the name that. of the first book? Because I now want to read it. The first book is either We Are Never Meeting in Real Life or Meaty. I can't remember which one came up first. No, the one that you talked about, the urban fantasy. N.K. Jemison. Oh, sorry. The City We Became, N.K. Okay. Jemison. Awesome. Um, Thank you. I recommend everything by M.K. Jemison. I have said this before and I'll say it again. If I did not need to work, my life would be I would not have a job. I would buy a bunch of copies of all of her books and I would stand on street corners and just hand them out to people. <laughs> and every, every like remotely public facing thing I do like this, I bring up her name as like an excuse for her to notice me one day. I'm just like, I just need you to know that I love your books so much. I have been invested in your career from back when you still had a nine to five job and were publishing books at the same time. Okay. I watched you in all three Hugos. I'm so in love with her. Her books are so great. Everybody should be reading them. Even though some people in this interview maybe weren't big fans, which I don't understand. Fine. Listen, the first series of a, from an author is sometimes a growing experience. I, per, on a personal level, need to read her other ones before I can have a <laughs> final saying. I'm just going to say. And if you're listening, N.K. Jemison, <laughs> N.K. Jemison, Christina would like to interview fans. you on this podcast. She never, she never will be. And that's probably for the best. You know, I don't know that I I'd want be able to interview her it. because she has a Patreon. And like, how does that fit in with her writing? Like, like that's, that's something. If, if listeners are interested in that, let us know and we'll see if we can get N.K. Jemison to talk about Patreon. I find that super interesting too, because when I first discovered her, like I was the one, when I, when I first read one of her books, it was one of those situations where I fell in love with an author, so I immediately had to learn everything about them. Oh, and I love when launched, you have to do that. <laughs> yeah. She had launched her Patreon either right before or right after I had been looking up her online. I still remember finding out that she had a nine to five job and somehow being like, people of talent get no credit. Like I was upset for her. I was like, you deserve to focus on writing and writing only. What do you mean you have to work nine to five? Yeah, I thought it was so interesting that she had a Patreon. And I think we're going to see, I think we're seeing more and more of that from creators on the internet as like the people that are supposed to be paying them don't. So regular people are like, no, but I want you to have money. So I will pay you instead directly. Like I find that such a fascinating concept but I was all there for it when she launched it I still have my account for that reason I love it thank you so much for talking to us today you gave us so many great tips so many yeah you were fantastic that felt like a very sly way to say I talked way too much but Uh, I appreciate that you had no we wanted you to talk that's what podcasts are for uh no thank you so much for having me on I, I love talking about this stuff and I think most people in my life are sick of hearing about it so always happy to Come on and talk marketing and talk books. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the 200th episode of the Kobo Writing Life podcast. If you enjoy our podcast, please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe because it helps other listeners find our podcast. And if you want to learn more about selling your books internationally, visit KoboWritingLife.com. This episode was produced by Joni DiPlacido and Stephanie McGrath. Editing was done by Kelly Robotham. Music was provided by Tia Jerker. And big thanks to Christina Mendez for chatting with us today. If you're ready to start your self-publishing journey today, sign up for free at kobo.com slash writing life. Until next time, happy writing.